All right. Teacher friends and student friends, lovers and haters of rhetorical analysis, Christian Kuhn coming at you for another writing workshop, affectionately known as the Bob Ross at Composition. And I have a super cool piece for rhetorical analysis for you. It's Matula Shakur's letter to Tupac the night that he passed away. And what's interesting about this piece is that Matula was in prison at the time of writing it. And just for context, I'm in New York State, so we don't start school until the day after Labor Day. And because of the rampant cheating that occurs when I use college board produced material, this was the rhetorical analysis passage I used for my midterm. So my students read it blind, they'd never seen it before, and they produced some really good writing. And what's super interesting about this is that my students were walking around school saying, Holy cow, we did the coolest thing in Mr. Kuhn's class. We did a rhetorical analysis of Matula Shakur's piece. How fascinating is that, that kids would talk so highly about a midterm exam, a midterm exam of all things. So let's jump in and take a look at the prompt. And what I'll do is I've constructed exemplars for the whole essay. So you'll see um, a few introductory paragraphs where I use my de declarative thesis heuristic and then some syllogistic body paragraphs. And I even wrote a couple of conclusions for you as well. So here's the prompt. A very basic, just kind of average fodder for a prompt. Dr. Matula Shakur, Tupac's stepfather, wrote two famous letters from his prison cell. The first one, printed below, was written on the night that he learned of Tupac's passing. Read the passage carefully. Write an essay that analyzes the rhetorical choices Matula makes to convey his message. So very basic. I didn't throw any zingers or curveballs at my students for the midterm. This is kind of a la what the College Board does for most of their prompts for FRQ uh, number two, which is the rhetorical analysis. So before I jump in and show you my exemplars, please subscribe to the channel. It's called Christian Kuhn, the Bob Ross of Composition. Spread the news far and wide. Tell your friends, tell your colleagues, tell other students about it. It's growing exponentially and it delights me. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is this. How do I write the introductory paragraph? And we know that since we're doing rhetorical analysis, we're going to declare the thesis. But as always, I'm going to tote my following adage. You got to Bob Ross your instruction. In order for this to make sense, Teachers need to get to the proverbial canvas and easel, a la Bob Ross. Use a heuristic, equip your kids with a heuristic, and paint with and for your students. So we know that Bob Ross, when he did natural landscapes, always used the wet on wet technique. And for all the expository modes, my students either declare or invert the thesis. And we're going to declare because we're using, uh, we're doing rhetorical analysis. And then all body paragraphs are written with the syllogistic method. And I'll hold your hand through that entire process and walk you through it. So there's a top security report that I want to breach. It's a dirty little secret and the college board will kill me if I tell you this, but I'm going to tell you anyways. Implicit in that prompt and implicit, therefore, in all college board prompts for FRQ2, and this is true of FRQ1 and FRQ2 of the literature exam, implicit are two questions. How does the author construct meaning and what is the authorial intent? So what my students do is they take three sentences to answer the question, how does the author construct meaning? And you've got to go get your terms, devices, techniques for that, right? Because those are the things that construct the meaning. And then one sentence for authorial intent. And by authorial intent, I just mean the exigence, the universal truth, the universal theme, etc. So that might be a little pie in the sky and ambivalent for you, but I'll show you my exemplars in just a second. So what we do is this. My students read, and while they're reading, they go term device technique hunting, right? And for this particular piece, what I did since it was the midterm exam was I didn't break it down until after the exam. So 
in that process, kids were like, oh, I missed that. I didn't see that. Or, oh, cool, man. I like I crushed the heck out of this piece. So if you're going to not use it as an exam and just use it as a practice rhetorical analysis, break it down and show kids all the terms, devices, techniques that are in it. So let's take a look at the declarative thesis graphically. So we know that when you declare the thesis, you're going to begin with the thesis. And here's the kicker with that. Whenever a student answers the question, how does the author construct meaning, that by default constitutes and comprises the thesis. But we got three sentences of that. And here's what I like about this. One term device technique does not construct the meaning. Usually it's a variety of like three to four things that the that the speaker does uh, that synthesizes and unites the meaning. So in, in these typically like 99% of the time, I tell my students to find the most three salient terms of the piece and you're going to crank three sentences for that. How does the author construct meaning? And that's the thesis that comes up top. You got to sprinkle in a little bit of context and background, and that's going to be the authorial intent uh, sentence. Tier two level vocabulary is a must. I like to see a fair amount of, you know, your average run of the mill SAT level caliber words. I run intensive word study academies in my classroom. So my students augment their vocabs exponentially over the course of the year, which is really nice to see because there is a vocabulary void with students of this generation. And then sentence constructs. I explicitly teach Strunk and White's Write It Right rule number 18. And they espouse the idea that there's 12 different ways to cobble together a sentence. But in addition, there's 20 ways to pattern those types. So in my models and exemplars, I'm going to be a syntactical ninja and bust out a whole bunch of chops and uh, show kids how to wield some funky sentences in order to achieve voice rhythm and flow. Because I always, always, always want my students to be in contention of that elusive unicorn sophistication point. And sentences definitely put you in contention for that. And three plus one equals four sentences. So let's recap that. Three plus one, three sentences, construction of meaning, one sentence, authorial intent. Here's exemplar number one. What I'll do is I'll read it from top to bottom and then I will break it down for you. So here it is. In Matula's letter to his son, the staccato sentence structure gives the piece a simultaneous breath of lamentation and exaltation. Giving voice to his ineffable loss, the father concludes many of his sentiments with a recurring refrain, that his love will endure the test of time and occupy all of eternity. In manipulating singular and plural pronouns, Matulu underscores the fact that he and his son are cut from the same cloth and that both men overcame seemingly insurmountable odds to lead remarkable lives. Despite dying on an ominous Friday the 13th, the father knows that the master plan of his son's demons are not to blame. This is the day that divine wisdom orchestrated. So let's go sentence by sentence here. So in the first sentence, I'm highlighting the syntax. And if you read this, you'll notice that there are a number of grammar errors and that things are rather truncated and staccato. And when I read it, it, it reads like, the breath of someone crying, the breath of someone lamenting. That's how we speak when we're really choked up. And the sentence constructs convey that, which I think is pretty cool. The recurring refrain, uh, you'll see it as you read the piece over and over and over again. My students called it an aphora, which comes at the beginning of sentences, but the refrain comes at the end of sentence, which is epistrophe. Uh, so um, I had to teach that concept to my kids. So that's the second thing I focus on. And then the pronouns, the, the singular and plural pronouns are really, really, really important. Uh, on that as well. And then towards the end here, I'm hitting on something really important on it. As, as uh, Matulu gets towards the end of the letter, heavy focus on Allah. There's a lot of, um, um, I don't know, like religious, not necessarily allusions, but references 
to the afterlife and the point of life. So those are the things that I would focus on in my thesis for this particular one. As you can see, my vocab is up. It's very nice. Sentence constructs are flowing. I even used a few dashes in there just to get the voice, the rhythm, the flow going. It's four sentences. That's the whole kit and caboodle. That might be confusing. It might be in the ether for kids and even for some teachers. So let's do it again. And I'll show you exemplar number two. On the day of his son's passing, Matulu pens a letter that is one half lamentation and one part celebratory for the unbelievable life Tupac managed to put together. Underscoring his exigence that his love will never fade, not even in the face of death. Tupac's father echoes this refrain from, uh, with unceasing fervor. At sentence level, Matulu wields recurrent short simple declaratives to further heighten his pain and great sense of loss. To honor his son, Matulu faithfully celebrates the duality that was Tupac's life, his blessings and demons. So same thing here, it's three plus one. I focus on three of the most relevant, germane, salient terms, devices, techniques. The only difference in this one is my last sentence. Uh, I, think, I think the father creates this juxtaposition within the piece where he says, you know, Tupac is a great guy, but he also had some flaws. And he, in the letter, he points out that he overcame a lot of demons. Both men overcame a lot of demons and that that needs to be acknowledged in death as well. So that's where I went in, in that particular one. Again, vocabs up, sentence structures are a flowing, four sentences, three construction of meaning, one authorial intent. Students might be looking at that saying, wow, this is hard. That's like some really good writing. Yes, you can. You can do this. Just takes a little bit of practice. Here's number three. Hours after hearing of his son's passing, Matula Shakur pens a heartfelt prayer to honor this remarkable life from his prison cell. With sentences that flow like a simultaneous lament and jubilation, Matula gives voice to his gut-wrenching pain and gratitude for having had the opportunity to father such an extraordinary human being. His frequent employment of epistrophe gets to the heart of his message that in spite of death, his love will never fade. Acknowledging that being a Shakur is not an easy birthright, the father manipulates his pronouns to underscore the fact that Tupac never had to do life alone, and the same can be said of the afterlife. Always four sentences. Focus on the you know three to four things that really constitute and comprise the construction of meaning. One sentence off theorial intent. Keep the tier two up, but in your wheelhouse. Don't use words you don't know. Don't make up words. The idea is not to use a million, million dollar words to sound fancy, right? You got to stay in your lane in this. And as always, cook up some nice sentence constructs. So one thing I want to point out in this that teachers and even maybe students saw me do in this, sometimes I implicitly state the term and sometimes I explicitly state the terms, the devices, the techniques. Why do I do such a thing? Well, we're going to get to the first premise in just a second. And what I like my students to do is teeter-totter balance being implicit and explicit. So if you imply the term in the introduction, you probably want to be explicit in the uh, first premise and vice versa with that. So good place to pause if you're writing along with me. Give that a whirl. Give it a try. And uh, show each other your work, students. And uh, teachers chime in and maybe you want to draft a couple of yourselves. Next question becomes, because we got a lot of canvas left, how do I write the body paragraphs? And as always, you're going to bust out the syllogistic method. I have a ton of videos in my YouTube channel in which I go over this. So I'm going to give a real cursory overview. It's rooted in the Aristotelian tradition. And it's basically like a formula. Aristotle called it a heuristic. I call it a heuristic as well. But some people aren't familiar with that word. So it's like a formula that you foul that gets you really into tight lines of reasoning. And Aristotle called that cogency. And all it is is when you argue from premise, premise to conclusion. So in the first premise, if I were to say arsenic is deadly, 
you all would nod your head and say, that's absolutely true, Christian. If I follow it up with a second premise that states, my dog ate arsenic, you're all going to naturally conclude, uh-oh, Christian, that's not going to bode well for your dog. Your dog's going to die, right? And that is a cogent argument. It's got a tight line of reasoning. So how do we morph that heuristic that Aristotle used for oration and blend it and mend it into a heuristic for the purposes of performing rhetorical analysis. It's really easy. First premise is going to be the argument in which we contain the terms, the devices, the techniques, right? And I tell my students, this should be three sentences long. I don't want any quotes. I don't want any paraphrases in those first three sentences. Keep the argument central. On FRQ1, uh, for the uh, AP Lang exam, students are told like three times, keep your argument central. Don't regurgitate the sources. And we don't want to regurgitate the letter and give like a play-by-play -play rundown of it, like a cliff note summation. So all that paraphrasing, all the quoting, hold off until the fourth sentence. Get anchored in an argument. Fourth sentence begins the second premise, and this is where we're going to teeter-totter balance the textual support between quoting and paraphrasing. And I'll model this for you. Sit tight. And then you need a conclusion to your paragraph. And this is where the textual analysis comes. And the first premise is a promise, so you got to go back to that, but you got to go back to the prompt and the thesis as well. And all of that takes about 10 to 12 sentences. So let's take a look at the first premise. And I'll break down what I did here for you. So students ask good questions and they often say, where do I start? And I always say, start where, start where Shakur started, right? Start at the beginning of the letter. So oftentimes my students will begin their body paragraphs with a stem that says this, right from the onset, comma. It cues the reader into knowing that you have a chronology, that you're going to have like this real good methodological approach, this chronological approach in your line of reasoning. So it cues your reader into knowing, hey, man, this kid's organized and he's going to like really proceed through this with precision. So let me read it to you again. It's three sentences. I will either imply or explicitly state the terms, the devices, techniques, but I just go cherry picking what's up top of the letter, like what's going on there rhetorically in terms of the construction of meaning. Here it is. Right from the onset, Tupac's father expresses the underlying sorrow in his refrain. At sentence level, his syntactical arrangements read like a broken cry trying to push forth a genuine sense of ineffable loss and gratitude. But in honoring his son, Matula is certain to capture the multifaceted nature of Tupac's evolution as a person, the good and the bad. So what do I have here? I have the epistrophe first, right? That refrain. So I said it in one of the introductions. I don't want to say it again, so I'm going to call it something else because you don't want to be reiterated. I got the syntax, but I also have that juxtaposition between the good angel and the bad angel on Tupac's shoulder. So... I really don't want my students doing one paragraph tone, one paragraph syntax, one paragraph diction, one paragraph pathos, etc. Too dutiful, too plodding, not mature, not going to get the sophistication point. So I like to see my students multitask in this uh, three sentence space. So let's recap that. First premise, three sentences, you need a rhetorical argument. From here, what I do when I write, like I'm, I'm going to like open up the lid of my brain for you. I go quote hunting. I look at that those first three sentences and I say, what am I promising? Right? I promised you three things in there. Now I need to go get quotes and or paraphrases for all three things that I stated in the promise of the first premise. And when I do so, it's going to look like this. So the second premise begins here. This is my fourth sentence, and I usually immediately get quoting in the fourth sentence. So I drop the word refrain. So I got to get to the epistrophe. I got to quote that, right? I'm, I kind of like cornered myself like a boxing match. I have to quote that now or paraphrase it. So check it out. Immediately, as in a similar manner to many Baptist hymns, the father begins his prayer with the recurrent epistrophe of, I love you whenever, forever. So do you see, I, I had to quote that because it was in it was a promise of my first premise. In doing so, Matula spells out the clear dichotomy that was at the core of Tupac's life. 
the fact that his spirit gave force to the rebellion. So I'm into his dichotomy, his juxtaposition, his torn persona uh, with that quote. Let's talk about quotes real quick and quote transitions. I use something called the five word rule. If a student places a minimum of five words in front of the quote and keeps the quote relatively small, it should sound conversational. You may need to bracket in order to get that to cop that conversational uh, feel to it. So you quote, you got to analyze. Even though Tupac was a penetrating contradiction, his father loved him regardless, even when his son was battling his personal demons. In the first few sentences alone, Matula's pain pours forth through his disregard for standard grammatical conventions. So now I'm into the syntax. Grief is messy and is not governed by confining laws, so it makes sense that the prayerfulness of the letter reverberates in the short staccato sentences. Proud of his son, Matula nonetheless has to concede that Tupac inherited it. It was in his genes. This unspoken it is the fact that Shakurs aren't born with silver spoons in their mouths. Instead, Shakurs have to understand that some of us are only one season while others, like Tupac, were part of many seasons. The plural pronoun suggests that Matula likewise knew the hellish deep freezes of winter's cold and also the majesty of summer's sweet sunshine. All right, do I have quotes and paraphrases for everything that I promised up top in that first premise? Yes, indeed, I do. I promised you three things, and there's a quote and or paraphrase, and sometimes multiple quotes and or paraphrases for all three things. But I ain't done. You got to conclude the thought, right? You got to wrap it all back to the thesis. This usually takes two sentences. In many regards, the father and son duo were cut from the same cloth. While the path was never easy, Matula acknowledges that his son left one heck of a legacy. Even though his life was taken short, in spite of this sad fact, he's endlessly proud. And that's how you do a syllogism, right? Top to bottom. So three sentences, first premise. Go get your quotes and your paraphrases, right? Keep the line of reasoning intact. Use that five-word rule. You're shooting for 10 to 12 sentences. So we're going to pause here. Students, take a, a, a try at writing your own syllogistic body paragraph. Start with the first premise and have somebody overlook your shoulder. Make sure you're on the right path. Go quote hunting and then piece it all together. All right. We have an intro and one body done. What do we do next? It's easy. You bust out another syllogism. We just have to ask ourselves, what's left? My students always write four paragraphs for all six FRQs laying in lit, right? So all FRQs, four paragraphs, intro, two bodies, conclusion. And what's left of this is we have all the religious references to Allah and the afterlife, Towards the end, the, the stepfather is making an amends to Tupac. we got to talk about that heavy pathos at the end. But he also really emphasizes the, sh the Shakur uh, duality, especially Tupac's, that he's a great guy, dude. He's got a legacy that's going to endure for years and years and years and years. But he wasn't a tip top guy. He's a rags to riches story. And, you know, it harkens back to, you know, the rose that grew from a crack in the concrete. That's his upbringing, right? That's, that's his origins. And that's part of his story and part of his duality. So let's wrap this essay up. we got to throw a conclusion paragraph on it. And I like the following stems. So I often liken the conclusion paragraph to the grand finale of a fireworks display. And students got to go big exigence, big theme, big universal truth. So to encapsulate those, um, those big moments, I like conclusion stems like simply said, evidentially, in no other words, when it's all said and done at the end of the day. And I usually just take three to four sentences to do, to do this. So a conclusion might look like this. At the end of the day, those who place their faith in a divine order often find ways to make peace with life's ineffable losses. While the father is reasonably saddled with grief, he nonetheless knows that the night's events are simply adhering to God's master plan. Taken way too young, Tupac nonetheless lived a life that surely will leave an enduring legacy. And we are done with this essay. Four paragraphs. All right, I'm signing off. Happy teaching, happy writing. If you need to reach out to me, 
My email address is teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. I always answer my emails. Don't hesitate to ask me a question. I love it, especially when students reach out to me. Even teachers, you guys are pretty cool. You can reach out to me as well. Also note that I'm a lead teacher for the National Writing Project. I present with NCTE, the College Board Perfection Learning all throughout the, uh, the the academic and calendar year. So on my webpage, I have a calendar, www.teachinghowtowrite.com. So you can stay abreast of our free webinars, my professional development opportunities. Most are free, some are for a nominal fee, but just go to the webpage and you can see uh, what's going on there. And then for students, know that I have my own tutoring company. I call it Write at Ivy Write. I'm a pro with college personal statements and supplements. I used to work in missions at Brown University, so I know exactly what the good schools are looking for. So if you want me to help you with that, drop me an email, teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. I've also been an AP Lang and AP Lit teacher for well over two decades, so I can get you over that hump successfully as well. All right, I'm signing off. I'll keep them coming, so please subscribe, stay tuned, and I will load videos as they come. Take care.